new ideas in project management and the latest trends in career innovation and business agility. This is Project Management on the Go, a podcast by the PMI Northern Italy chapter. Hello everybody and welcome back our listeners to another episode of the Project Management on the Go podcast from PMI Northern Italy where we aim to provide you with interesting insights on the project management profession through our special guests. My name is Emre Manetolu and I volunteer at the PMI Northern Italy chapter. For this episode, our guest is from Australia. She is an internationally recognized expert in project management, Annie Sheehan. Today's topic is related to sponsors and sponsorship on projects. We will also talk about her latest book, The Courageous Sponsor. Welcome to the podcast, Annie. Thank you, Emre. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming to the podcast. First, I would like to ask you to tell us about yourself so our listeners can know from you more. My first career was as an IT analyst programmer, and yes. you can probably tell from my accent that I grew up in England. And then through the software house that I worked, I managed to get some work internationally and worked, lived and worked in Singapore and worked a lot around Asia. And then I moved to Australia a bit over 20 years ago. And I specialized then in project management. Mm -hmm. And then I've done various different roles, including as an agile project coach, and then as an executive coach and doing capability development. And then over the last couple of years, I've written some books, done some independent consulting. I volunteered for PMI. For a number of years, past chapter like president you. of the Australian chapter and a former region mentor. And I'm now working for PMI. So it's pretty exciting. Thank you. <laughs> so you wrote the book about sponsors, actually. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a courageous sponsor? So the number one challenge facing a lot of project sponsors is that they don't really understand what's expected of them in the role. A lot of people who are business leaders get appointed as project sponsors and they don't know how to ask for help and they often get stuck. And the first step to being courageous is actually asking for help, admitting that you don't know all the answers and putting yourself out there, showing up, being brave, working with the team and really looking at both people and performance to get results. So that's really what it means to be courageous. It's, it's showing up, having a go, asking for help, and then that process of continuous improvement. Interesting. Actually, I have read the book, as I told you before, and it's quite interesting also for the project managers, experienced project managers, because it goes both ways. So also the project managers need to know when to escalate to the sponsor some issues. Absolutely. So I think it's also interesting, not only for the sponsors, but also for the project managers. That's right. I think um, the big thing that I've noticed is that Project managers forget that their sponsors also have a day job on top of being a sponsor, that there's very few full-time sponsors. And whilst the project is often all consuming for the project manager, it's not necessarily so for the sponsor. They've often got a business unit to run and they have other things competing for their time and attention. And there are several things that are important. And it's really good for both the sponsor and the project manager to understand each other, what's going on for them, and to respect each other's needs and wishes and make sure that they work together in a respectful partnership to, to get to the outcomes. Exactly. So you also, in the book, you also categorize the sponsor behaviors, mm -hmm. as you call them, sponsor personas. Can you talk about these? Yeah, so I have been coaching sponsors and working with sponsors very actively since uh, for, for a bit over 20 years. And some of it's been very deliberate. I noticed different behaviours that were coming out and some people were easier to work with than others. And then in 2015, I was involved in a sponsor capability programme 
the organization that I was working at and actually conducted a research project then and pulled together personal research on the different sponsor types within that organization and previous organizations I work with and this was taken from a, from a large pool of people and we noticed these archetypes or personas that came up and just the different behaviors attributed to those and for the book I actually distilled them into birds so what we have is the aggressive magpie who's you're not quite sure which version you're going to get and they're very much about performance and they often forget about people so they can be a bit unpredictable and the team gets a bit stressed out with them and then you have your avoidant ostrich who pretend everything's okay but they don't actually want to have any accountability and you ask them for anything and you can't find them they're, they're harder to find than the Loch Ness monster that you know they disappear off and they make some excuses but they won't actually make any decisions or help you so they're neither about people or performance okay. and then moving into the more courageous types we, we notice that you know new sponsors I call them our curious ducks I've worked, been fortunate enough to work with several of those and they typically say well I don't know what I'm doing um, but I'm here to get a great result and can we work together and I'm here to learn and they're just like the duck um, looking as if they're calm on the surface but they're pedaling quite hard underneath and they're very approachable and they work really well with the team and then we've got the courageous eagles and they are the ones that are about people and performance and they are there flying above the landscape they've really got their eye on the vision so and I think that's one of the most important attributes for a sponsor is to be able to communicate and impress the vision on the, the, the team and the stakeholders mm -hmm. they've got their eye on the landscape and they're holding their wings out protectively to look after the team um, but they might be when there's trouble they'll get down and um, swoop down into the grass like you might hear a, a mouse in the grass deal with whatever's going on at the detailed level and then you know swoop back up to protect the team again once the the issue's been dealt with and those are my role model sponsors really is is the are the eagles so so those are the four main types that i encourage people to be aware of their behavior um the eagles are obviously ideal because they're the ones that inspire high performing teams and those are the ones that project teams want to work with again yes interesting so in your book you'll talk about also the sponsorship productivity ladder and it's five levels actually you also categorize these can you talk about these levels yeah so some key things what i've seen in extreme cases is level one where you've got a leader that's been appointed usually for more than one project and they don't really understand project management and they don't really understand where to start and they're not helping their team and their team can't help them and that's what I call level one which is paralyzed and they're out of the game and I've seen that in some organizations smaller organizations typically where they haven't been able to deliver a successful project for an quite a while and there was one that I'd worked with that hadn't been able to deliver a project successfully for about five years and you know their reputation was really really poor mm -hmm. and usually the first point really is asking for help so when they ask ask for help this is what happened in this particular case I worked with the CEO and his leadership team to help them to do some strategic planning and to determine which projects were the most important and they had a lot of projects on the list so for example they, let's say they had 25 but they really only had the capacity to do about eight projects so I helped them I just asked a series of questions they were making the decisions and I said look you really it's better that you do a few well than you try to do many and then they all go badly and they had had a situation where the they used what we call rag reporting, red, amber, green, and nearly all of their projects were red. And I think they had one green project. Mm. And working with them over a period of about 
18 months, helping them to strategize and plan. And then we reduced the, the 25 projects down to eight. And then about 15 months later, all their projects were, were green and um, yellow, and they had restored confidence in their business and were getting better support and funding. So they moved up to level two once they had the, the planning, the 25 projects cut down to eight. They had people assigned to things. They started planning and moving, and then they got to a level level three, which is stable. If we use some agile terminology, we, we ran it, um, the projects in, the, in an agile manner. So we made sure that we had strategic portfolio planning. We had daily stand-ups for the individual projects. We had twice weekly stand-ups for the overall portfolio. We made sure that there were the right people there to help clear roadblocks, the sponsors turned up. And then probably six to eight months later, they would got into a really good um, learning mode and were able to sort of look back every 90 days to see how they'd gone, running retrospectives, applying lessons learned, saying this, this is what went well, this is what went not so well, this is what we're going to do next time. Yes. And um, they went through an agile transformation and went to kicking goals in about an 18-month period, which was fantastic. And then other people were looking at them and saying, what are you doing? We want some of that. And they've continued to do that, which is fantastic. So that was you know, a few years ago, and they're still maintaining that, which is absolutely fantastic. So it also sticked with the organization, that means, right? It does. When you see it works for you and you have this, the leadership team that are largely in place, yeah, it does. It sticks. It tends to stick. So that's fantastic. Um, and I think the big lesson is don't take it for granted and then start thinking that everything's easy because it will fall apart again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as always. So for the practical side, this is generally the overview of the of the two aspects. For the practical side, what is the procedure to start to get prepared mentally and practically to be a courageous sponsor? Could you walk us through the steps quickly? Of course, this is a long discussion, actually. Well, step one is understand where you're where you're at. So there's a self assessment tool in the in the book, um, and you can download the first two chapters, which have got the self-assessment in it as well from um, my website, if you'd like. And then really the step one is asking for help and going to somebody that you trust, who's got experience in projects. Um, that might be another sponsor who's experienced. And then it's really doing what I, I gave you in the example, which is really start prioritizing which projects are important and why and important for continuing to run your business or your business unit and important for enabling you to deliver on your strategy. And I use a number of different tools. So one's a payoff matrix and you really need to decide what's going to be important and in terms of business value and Focus on the things that are easier to deliver in, the sh in a shorter time frame as well. There are a few values in there. So my encouragement is if it's easy to do and it adds value, do that first rather than trying to do the things that will deliver you value in three years' time. Mm -hmm. What can deliver you value in the next 90 days, for example, or 180 and be a great value to your, your customers and to your business? And then I think that the next most important really is making decisions quickly and what I classify as failing forward. So, you know, learn from things and it's the cost of inaction. So if you're taking action, that's progressing you towards something. Um, it's a bit like sailing a boat. Um, you know, you don't just sit there in the water and hope for the best you're either using you're using walls if there's no wind or you're, you're steering into the wind and you're learning as you go and you're you're navigating your path and then it's really it's about the people you're wanting to bring people with you so how do you agree how you're going to operate with your team so if you're a project manager you know what do you ask your sponsor 
one of the things I used to do was to make sure that I had regular catch-ups with my sponsor and they honoured that time and I was able to walk them through the status report and show them where to pay attention and then ask them what they needed from me just to make sure that things were, were going well, but making sure that you honour you know, codes of conduct and those sorts of things. Very good. You mentioned your website. Could you give us the address? It's uh, annie-sheehan.com. Obviously, the www at the okay. beginning. <laughs> okay. Our listeners, if they are interested, they can go to the website and download the first two chapters to see the yeah. book. Dear listeners, as you may know already, our chapter is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, and we are doing a treasure hunt. The code from this September episode is PMP. Please take a note. So once you completed the self-assessment and prioritized the projects, what are the next steps in order to get a clear roadmap? Maybe if possible, could you give us a real life example on this? Yeah, well, it's really important to have an overall roadmap for all your projects. The, the easiest is often to start with something that's really quite significant. And what I tend to do is get a large piece of butcher's paper, draw a mm -hmm. squiggly line on it, and at the end we've got a little lighthouse at the end. And the lighthouse indicates the sponsor's vision. What's the outcome that they want to achieve at the end of it? What are the team working on? And when they're getting lost in the weeds, how do they know where they're going? So, you know, having that lighthouse and that really clear vision at the end. So if I give you an example, there was one project that I worked on that was really clear. It was a new travel card product. And I was working for a bank at the time. And the sponsor was really, really clear that he wanted this new product. It had to be switched over on a particular date. And one of his key stakeholders wanted to make sure that it was linked to internet banking so that as you were traveling, you could top up the currency as you were traveling and you could you could do it on your smartphone. And then no cards at the time in the world could do that. So he was extremely clear on what he wanted as the vision. And things were divided up into quarters. Mm -hmm. So you can see really clearly, you, you then map out your milestones along those quarters to see what is it that you need to have achieved by a particular point. And you use those quarters actually to take a bit of time out to reflect as a, the team to see right, where have we come from, what have we achieved, what's still to go, how are we going with the risks, how are we going to deliver to this um, particular timeline. He'd had a challenge as well where he had underestimated the technology component of this and he needed to he was advised in order to actually make the date that he needed to get in a, a technical advisor which he then did and escalated some things and then you know he had a couple of surprises he needed to escalate some, some things stop some other projects elsewhere in the bank get those resources diverted to helping him out and then they actually managed to deliver and the the product paid for itself within a month and was an absolute customer delight and we did a big retrospective at the end and got a lot of feedback on what went well and um, what hadn't gone so well and what he'd apply for the next time and this particular sponsor had been a bit of a magpie sponsor and then he went on to be a really good Eagle sponsor following on from that. But he was very, very clear on what success looked like for his business and his customers, and he achieved it. It was fantastic. Yes, it's really fantastic. Okay, so you talked about the roadmap, the lighthouse. You create the roadmap, then the success factors also are defined. So you have a uh -huh. vision and the details, and the project is put under control. What about the last step in the ladder, which is transforming and kicking goals? So you can't get to level five unless you've got a learning mindset. And you obviously, you can't get to level five when you're 
start you know just starting out it comes after you've got some experience so you're looking at really holistically what went well what hasn't gone so well but what do we want to adopt as our way of working going forward and then what do we want to do what ceremonies and habits do we want to have where we can have this guided continuous improvement so I think that's really where you're you're transforming it. You know, who are you going to listen to? Where are you going to get your information from? I think it's really important that you look within. Um, you're looking to your stakeholders. You're looking to the team. Um, you're looking beyond your team, but you're also going out to your customers, and then you're also looking out broadly to industry to find out what else is happening out there that we could try so that we can keep getting better. So that's really what that's about. And obviously things like COVID have really disrupted people's ways of working. Um, some organizations and some teams have done extremely well during COVID and managed to keep connected collaboration, even with you know extended lockdowns or distance working and others haven't. So what are you doing to make sure that that human connection is still going, but you are focused on the intersection of people and performance? Clear. So now we are approaching to the end of the podcast. I would ask you a question that can also summarize the important points of what we have discussed. What are the top actionable tips you can give to our audience about courageous sponsorships? Surveying sponsors and surveying project managers. Nearly every project manager values a sponsor that turns up when they say they're going to turn up, actually shows that they care, asks the team how they are and what is needed, and that the team is honest in where they're at in terms of the progress that they've made, the challenges they're facing, and that they can have a really respectful, honest conversation and they can ask for help and get better together. And the other thing that I know particularly with both, that I think project managers and sponsors are equally bad and some developers, is that try to avoid scope creep as much as possible and you know, using prioritization well and saying, you know, if you're not trying to sneak something in, do we really need that? You know, I really love agile backlogs and you've got them prioritized in terms of those that business value and that ease to complete. It, you know, really look at doing the stuff that's worth it, that is really needed as opposed to, you know, well, I could I could fit this in and I, I really wanted to do it. So it's, you know, working on those priorities and letting unimportant things go. Um, big things for the sponsor. Sponsors really set the tone from the top. So if they're friendly and approachable and collaborative, that's wonderful. They can model the appropriate behavior for the team and set the tone for the team. And I work with one really fantastic CFO who really made the time to come down regularly he was on i think he was on the 17th floor and we were on the ninth floor of a building he would come down regularly to say hello to the team and to say thank you so you know we we had regular um morning teas and we had a really lovely post project celebration and he lovely speeches and everything just just really nice and showed a level of appreciation um he also would address issues really well with with empathy even when people were saying you know things are really going badly and it maybe had escalated inappropriately he would address the issue not the person and then he would address any sort of bad behavior and he did it in a really constructive way so i thought that was fantastic and modeling that behavior and that courageous behavior where you can have a difficult conversation openly encourages and inspires the team it makes the team feel safe well i know i felt safe i know my team felt safe we ended up being a really high performing team you get the results. That's fantastic. You're really bringing people with you. Um, another thing for the sponsor is just making sure that you've got other people you can call on beyond your team. 
Uh, I think I've mentioned this earlier. If you've got somebody who's a trusted advisor, who's a sponsor, who you can learn from, who can give you a diff different perspective, that's that's really great. And then that means that if you're really worried that your team's not performing, you can ask some questions and either have your worries soothed or find a way to deal with them. And I've already talked about having a retrospective day every sort of three months or so and do a team building day. And I think the most important for each of us, in some cases, we don't have that much control over what happens. So plan for the worst and hope for the best. And sometimes the worst happens. You can always choose your response. So from each experience, if it didn't go so well, you just go, okay, what did I do? What happened? And what can I do and improve for the next time? And one of the sponsors that I work with, he actually had a review of how he'd been going. He'd been pushing the team incredibly hard. And he hadn't really been listening to his team who said, you know, things were a bit of a struggle. And he pushed them for a date when he didn't need to. And what happened was actually three of his core team members quit. Mm -hmm. And then he was kind of stuck. And then his new project manager came on and I got called in to help do, do some coaching with the team and the sponsor. And the sponsor was incredibly brave. He had an assessment done and it didn't go very well. <laughs> He adopted some new ways of working for the next phase of his project, which included a project kickoff, making sure he had a team meeting, making sure that he had regular check-ins. And six months later, he had another assessment and he was quite nervous. And I said, well, how do you think it went? And he said, I don't know, because the last time I thought I was doing all right and it turned out not so well. I said, well, actually, you did all right. And uh, some of the very same people that had been criticising him six months earlier then were complimenting him at the end so that chap he had started as a magpie and um, an occasional magpie and he became an eagle and then actually at the top level I talk about owl sponsors which are eagle sponsors who end up coaching other sponsors they're the wise owls and he's just he's fantastic and he still coaches sponsors to this day he's an absolutely fantastic person very well thanks do you have some additional tips so in terms of Project managers working with sponsors. The, probably the most important is to have some compassion for your sponsor. And don't assume that they're the enemy. Yeah. Um, you want to be speaking to them as if you're as if you're peers rather than they are more senior than than you. So don't be intimidated by their positional hierarchy. Be respectful, but also you are coming with a skill set that they don't have. So value yourself, know your worth, know your skills, and be firm on some things where you need to be, but also listen to your sponsor. You know, it's also important for you to ask them how they are and and one sponsor that I had an absolutely fantastic relationship with, we had weekly catch-ups. I was managing a large SAP program and we would catch up for coffee every Monday at about 10 o'clock. And we actually started with asking each other how each of us was and how we had children about the same age. We'd talk about our children. And then we'd get on to, to business, usually within about, Five, five or seven minutes or so of starting the course, the sort of the meeting. And she lives near me and we still bump into each other and it's still, we're still all smiles with each other. I mean, the, the, that project was tough, but we ended up landing it. It went well. She was a great person to escalate to. She was new as a sponsor. Mm -hmm. She really appreciated the coaching. I appreciated her as a sponsor because she did what she said she was going to do. And we were a team and it was brilliant and it just worked really, really well. So I think that's really it 
in terms of you know building your relationship. Another tip is if things are going really badly for you as a project manager, and um, my strongest tip is break bad news early and as well as you can without frightening your sponsor. Um, bad news is not like good wine. It does not improve with age. So come with a problem, but also say, this is how I think we can solve it, or actually I'm stuck. This has come out of the blue. I want to alert you to this, hmm. and I think I'm going to need your help. And then ask them to help you work through it or say, I'm going to need this person and this person to work through it. And I've seen that work really well. But if you pretend that everything's all right, it's going to blow up and your project's going to go badly and your sponsor's not going to be happy. So those are probably the two strongest Absolutely. pieces of advice. And as a, you know, as a sponsor, when your project manager's coming to you with bad news, don't yell, take a breath. <laughs> Try to solve things. Starting position is with empathy. And then it is right now, how are we going to solve this? I'm sorry this has happened. Okay, how are we going to work through this? So don't be that aggressive magpie or that run for the hills ostrich. It's right, okay, what are we going to do? And we're in this together. So that's it. Very nice tips. Thank you. Annie, thank you very much for joining us. This has been an excellent and informative conversation. I hope our listeners enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Please tell us also where we can get the book. It can help our audience. Yes, you can buy the book on Amazon. Search on Amazon and just for the courageous sponsor in my name. And yes, you'll find it there and you can get it on Kindle um, or printed book. I've been promising I'll do the audio book soon. So hopefully within the next couple of months, the audio book will be ready as well. So thank you. Very well. Thanks, Annie. Dear listeners, as always, thank you for listening. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Have you enjoyed this episode? Then don't forget to activate the alerts or to follow us so you will not miss the next ones. This PMI NIC podcast grants you 0.5 PDU. You can report on the PMI CCRS section online or digital media. We are waiting for you at the next episode of Project Management on the Go. Music